My name is Keen Fitzgerald. I am a I am the security and defense researcher here at the Institute for International and European Affairs. My research generally focuses on great power competition and its implications for the Irish security environment. I am delighted to welcome you here to this IIA webinar, where we are joined uh, today by Professor Nicholas Timiades, Professor of Homeland Security at Penn State Harrisburg and author of Chinese Intelligence Operations, who has been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak to us today. Professor Eftimiades will give a presentation to us for about 30 minutes, and following this, we will proceed to a Q&A with the audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And then please feel free to send your questions into the, uh, feel free, please feel free to send your questions in, uh, in throughout the presentation as they, occur, as they occur to you. And we'll come to them once Professor Timiades has come to his presentation. Just a quick reminder to everyone that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. And if you'd like to join the discussion on Twitter, uh, please use the handle at IIEA. So I now formally introduce Professor Timiades, and then I'll hand over to him. Nicholas Timiades is a professor at Penn State University and author of the book, Chinese Intelligence Operations. He's a member of the graduate faculty teaching Homeland Security, Intelligence and National Security Policy. He conducts research on China's economic espionage intelligence and emerging threats and disruptive technologies. Mr. Temiades retired from a 34 year government career in intelligence and diplomacy and has extensive experience and has published widely on China and the national security space. Mr. Temiades um, held senior appointments to the Department of Defense Science Board, the Department of Homeland Security Advisory Council and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, National Intelligence Council. He's also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and Auburn University McRae Institute for Cyber and Critical Infrastructure Security. Professor Timiades, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Let me uh, just start out by just saying one thing that my comments do not represent Penn State University. Um, so I'm speaking as an individual today. Uh, what I'd like to do is take the next um, 25 minutes or so to give you an overview of Chinese espionage. Okay, sorry about that. Sorry for the slow start. And I only have uh, uh, 30 minutes to share a lifetime's worth of knowledge. I've been tracking the subject for the better part of 30 years. Um, uh, and it's only the past couple of years anyone around the world has uh, has um, really cared about it. And uh, But it's a good thing because people are starting to uh, wake up and understand the significance of exactly what China has been doing, what it's been doing for decades, and actually escalating in tempo and um, uh, capabilities over the course of the past decade. So let's just jump into this and take a look at the overview. There are a couple of ways of cataloging what the media will typically call espionage, right? Um, you know, there is covert action, which is covert influence. And um, I think actually you've recently had a case of that, of, uh, of um, spying against the diaspora and influencing parliament, things like, uh, as we see in the UK on uh, now it appears multiple occasions. So there's traditional espionage, which in the United States is coded 18 U.S.C. 790 series. It's an actual series of espionage violations that you do against governments uh, in secret, um, you know, taking out secret materials. Economic espionage, which is probably one of the more extensive activities that China conducts. And that includes technology and trade secrets. The United States estimates its losses anywhere between four to, or you know, four to six hundred billion a year due to this type of technology and theft of trade secrets. Um, I, I probably put that a bit lower, at three eighty six. Uh, Eighty seven percent of even all the fake products that are coming into the China, uh, U.S. come from China. Eighty two percent from Europe, or rather, uh, eighty two percent of the fake products coming into Europe. Uh, you know, come from China and 80% um, to uh, Canada has that figure of 80%. So we get a lot of theft of trade secrets, reproduction of items and things like that, that come into the country, which really affects the economic base. This all comes under one category of economic espionage. Illegal exports. Um, in, in addition to just stealing technology and trade secrets, we have stealing, um, stealing physically, uh, um, uh, items that are not, uh, not, you know, set for export, not releasable for export. You know, as, as an example, semiconductors, which I know you have production there, uh, and a lot of other items that China just steals, and in fact has been able to support its military that way. 
Research violations. Lastly, research violations. Uh, we, we had quite an aggressive campaign against this in the United States to actually look at the theft of research done out of universities, uh, primarily out of universities and research institutes. I'll give you a bottom line up front. And the bottom line is that uh, foreign technology is highly prized um, you know, for Chinese intelligence collectors. Covert influence is also top on the list of their activities. Their commercial collection efforts in you know, stealing um, technology and trade secrets are and primarily technology are really identified in PRC's national planning documents, such as Made in China 2025, 50 year, um, 50 year uh, plan for um, uh, development of space technology and a number of agricultural technology and a number of other uh, seminal documents produced by the party at the highest levels. Over the last 20 years, I can tell you, because I've been watching this and show you a trend line that China has aggressively expanded its espionage networks. That much I think is, sorry, pretty obvious. Uh, lots participate in China's intelligence activities, which is why we call it a whole of society approach. Okay? Differing from Western services, where you generally just have, you know, in America, the CIA, maybe the FBI, and a few other agencies that are engaged in, es in espionage, that's not the case in China. In fact, in China, you have state-owned enterprises, uh, private companies, individuals, and select universities all conducting espionage activities. Uh, if you want to think about the vastness of this state-owned enterprises, there are, used to be 300, but there are 150,000 of them in China. 50,000 of them are which at the, are at the national level. And um, about 120 or so are, are prize national economic security state-owned enterprises, and many of them have oh, well over 100,000 employees each, research institutions, et cetera. All this is levied as part of the collection apparatus that China has specifically towards foreign technology and trade secrets. Lastly, um, it's it's interesting because because you have so many players in this whole of society approach, you have um, a wide variance of what we call trade craft, the espionage techniques that are used. Uh, sometimes you even have that you see that variance within agencies, like within the Ministry of State Security. Uh, so there's a wide variance in, in how they conduct, and, and you can actually catalog it against specific um, specific industries. Cyber is probably the exception, and they show pretty standard techniques in that. So if you're looking at um, economic espionage along the continuum, you see just the, the vast number of um, capabilities that they bring to bear. Uh, starting on the left, you, you go from open source literature to science and technology exchanges, trade fairs, Chinese scholars and students, buying foreign experts, acquisition and mergers, all the way up to economic espionage. And, that, and all these are leveraged in support of the state. These are the ones that we'll look a little um, uh, more seriously at today. The types of collectors, whereas again, I pointed out that we in the US are, um, are uh, you know, I, I think in the West, I should say rather, uh, you know, typically have our government agencies involved with this, with China, the Ministry of State Security and Public Security, are the traditional collectors, the Joint Intelligence Bureau under the Central Military Commission, they're military collectors. Uh, they have the Political Work Department, Liaison Bureau, again, military entity, uh, traditional collectors. But they also use, and this is a Western definition, all right? And it's not a Chinese definition. They also use um, non-traditional collectors, state-owned enterprises, CCP organizations, as I mentioned, such as the United Front Work Department, uh, university scholars, companies. Now, these can operate independently of the PRC intelligence services. So you look at just the vastness of the enterprise that they have actually out collecting. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty formidable, um, formidable collection of organizations. Let's look at um, some of the uh, espionage, the categories overviews. Now, what you're seeing now is a compilation of... Um, of uh, information out of my database. And my database has about 770 something uh, cases, details on 770 cases of quote espionage. That's the big word espionage with all the economic and, and um, trade theft and espionage and covert influence operations all under that. So we have about 772 cases and it's very, very detailed for each one. And what that allows you to do is to um, really uh, understand what 
you know, what is going on and who's doing what with, um, with uh, you know, relative to, uh, uh, sorry, China's activities. So if we were to just look at economic espionage, you would have state-owned enterprises conducting at about a total of 174 cases out of that database. You would have 24% um, uh, being done by state-owned enterprises, more than half of them done by private companies. Uh, you have 11% uh, done by the Ministry of State Security, the PLA very marginally involved in economic espionage, and um, others such as universities and uh, research institutes at 10%. So if you're looking at this from a defensive posture or from a posture, from a legislative posture even, you know, your, your primary problem here are Chinese companies that are stealing. And this doesn't even include the forced transfer of technology. It's just the stealing of technology, um, you know, from from your own companies, from Western, Western companies. Uh, I should also make it a point that um, that I don't do a lot of cyber tracking. And the reason I don't do a lot of cyber tracking is there are a lot of experts out there that do. And it's difficult to get uh, real details on the um, on the actual cases. No one likes talking about them, certainly not the least of which of people have been penetrated and lost their uh, their intellectual property. Uh, here we have a great way of looking. At the, there are some cases that I do track, as you can see on the left. But here we have a great way of looking and understanding the tradecraft involved. And this I do for primarily for security services and such, and, and actually into such greater lengths. But um, we have tailor-made devices or third country meetings. Sorry about that. On the left, or rather on the far right, you can see no tradecraft and open communications and true names is the preferred type of technique that's used for this. That's, so it means we're just looking at straight theft. And yet we do have um, also uh, uh, you know, a notable amount of false names that are used for this type of thing or use of third parties to steal, um, to, uh, steal technology and, in, and intellectual property, encryption standards or meetings held in China. So for an insider threat specialist or for security specialists, you can start to determine, well, if there are a lot of meetings held in China, this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at, you know, the, uh, a lot of this person keeps going back and forth to China. It's what they would call as an indicator in that world that something might be amiss and something you start to look at. But specific components of the tradecraft and what is actually used to collect information. Okay, if we, um, sorry, uh, move a little more towards um, our understanding. If we move a little more towards our understanding of, um, of uh, PRC organizations conducting espionage, and this gives you a breakdown of what you're looking at. This is uh, espionage, espionage, um, you know, across the whole board, not just economic. So if you, you take a look, you can see that um, private companies, uh, about 150 in cases like this, state-owned enterprises, 123. Ministry of State Security, you can see 126, the People's Liberation Army, 134, and other elements, meaning universities and um, research institutes at uh, 148. So if anything illustrates the case for a whole of society approach, this does. You see, and each one of the MSS alone has 100,000 employees, it's estimated at. So, and, and it's not by only means the, uh, the only one playing in this game. So there are a lot of organizations playing on a global collection effort. And this is one of the reasons that China is able to build its military and to build its economic wealth. It's one of the reasons it makes it almost impossible to compete because all those decades and billions of dollars that are invested in R&D are lost because they're stealing it. And I'll give you an example of one company that I worked with which uh, had a $400 million loss in energy company uh, when you know one of their employees had been going back and forth to China, allegedly visiting family. And you know ultimately they were able to discover the fact that he was uh, uploading that information onto, um, onto a server on the web and it was being accessed in China. So you know for them, now they, they have a competition and a loss of 400 million or so in research, research dollars. Um, once again, just their use of espionage tradecraft, uh, and this is not economic espionage, but this is espionage sort of as a whole, and you can kind of take a look when you look across the board um, where no tradecraft, no espionage tradecraft or techniques are employed, uh, what are simply false 
you know, false names or documents and third party usage and just basic encryption standards and um, and uh, meetings, you know, meetings held in China. So the trade craft differs depending on what type of theft that you're actually looking at, whether you're looking at economic espionage and dealing with corporations or whether you're taking a whole swath and looking at, um, you know, including national espionage, you know, against government secrets and influence operations. The type of trade craft differs depending not only that, but the industry that you're looking at. Uh, that you're assessing. In the case of covert action, and let me clarify here for our purposes, wait, for our purposes, covert action or, I mean, not everything is espionage, right? So the example of, um, of Christine Lee with the UK, uh, and I'll go into that in just a moment, where a person was influencing parliamentarians and giving money. And of course, you know, they probably don't uh, don't know where that money is coming from, but she's actually being paid to influence them. That's a covert action because it's not really espionage, but it's a covert activity done at the behest of a nation state. So in that case, when you take a look, uh, again, you see massive players, the United Front Work Department, tens of thousands of people uh, in the United Front and and offices and associations span out globally. The People's Liberation Army, the Ministry of State Security, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are all engaging in, um, in covert action or covert influence. Uh, this is a slide which just shows the number of cases tied to the specific type of espionage, as I had mentioned earlier. In the US, ITAR, IEPA, EA, uh, and um, ASEA are all uh, illegal export of technology, military related technology. Okay. So you could actually combine those into one and you get I don't know, 140 cases that uh, that actually having occurred. EAR, uh, Export Administration Regulations, is the illegal export of dual use technology. And I hold that separately. And then we have kind of the standards, research violations, 31 cases, espionage cases, 128, economic espionage uh, cases, 124, and civil actions, 24. So you, you can kind of get a spread of what China's doing across all boards relative to a whole of society approach and their massive collection apparatus. We'll just take a quick look at a, a couple of cases. This is Christine Fang, otherwise known as Fang Fang. She was um, uh, in 2015. She fled the country because there was an FBI uh, FBI investigation. There she is in the center with Congressman Swalwell, who uh, she worked uh, uh, closely for and with, um, and uh, and even up to the point that he was uh, uh, running for presidency. She. Um, she had built a number of relationships. She was a student at a um, college in San Francisco, and she became president of the Chinese Student Scholars Association, president of the Asian Pacific Islanders uh, American uh, Public Affairs uh, Association. She used these for what we call cover for status and cover for action. Okay, She used these to allow her access into the Chinese American community and having influence and action in the Chinese American community, she was able to turn around to US politicians and say, hey, I have this type of access. And, and immediately she was accepted into political ranks as support, as an advisor. Uh, but in the meantime, the reason the FBI identified her was because that uh, she had been meeting with an intelligence officer out of the San Francisco consulate. Uh, ultimately, they picked up on her and said, well, wait a minute. Uh, who is this person? And they tracked her down and 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 saw that she had a relationship of, of undisclosed sorts with uh, Congressman Swalwell. In addition, she was also having, which they did announce, um, multiple affairs, two of which, which were with uh, mayors in the Midwest of the United States. So she would travel out there and the FBI would follow her. So... Uh, and you know, then she would report back to um, to the San Francisco consulate. At the me at the same time, the uh, MSS officials were also uh, running the staffer, the driver, and um, local representative for Senator Dianne Feinstein, who was also reporting to the uh, to the Ministry of State Security. Christine uh, Fang had access to Representative Swalwell, Mayor Harrison, um, and Representative uh, Ka um, Ka Kana all of which he was doing volunteer work and even actually placed a um, an intern in the office for Swalwell. So as we say, she had access, she had close access, she had good cover for status and action, um, was doing reporting as far as we know, uh, going back to the Ministry of State Security, potentially influencing every one of those individuals that she um, 
that she had access to and contact. And we saw some of that in their trips going to China. And um, uh, when the FBI approached um, at that time, Congressman Swalwell, uh, she fled the country. Uh, Christine Lee, who was actually originally identified in 2015, it was only recently that, um, that um, the Brits took any action against her. Uh, Christine Lee, uh, the MI5 put out a, no a notice, the Security Service put out a notice to Parliament about her, uh, the affiliations that she had, and the fact that she was working in the embassy, you know, she was a, a UK citizen, but working, uh, actually dual, uh, with China as well, but working in the embassy for the United Front Work Department located in the embassy. And meanwhile, she was controlling a number of um, uh, not only associated with the Overseas Friendship Associations, which are elements of the United Front, but um, she had uh, established a British Chinese project, had a number of parliamentarians under it, uh, was allegedly representing the Asian population in the UK. But the reality is that she was taking orders from um, from uh, the United Front Work Department. So they put out a notice about her and uh, everybody cut contact. She had contributed 600,000 pounds to um, primarily one British parliamentarian, but, uh, but to other parliamentarians as well from both parties. So you can see her background here that, um, you know, um, Barry Gardner, uh, an MP, which she made uh, 200,000, uh, rather 600,000 in donations to him. Her son was working for, uh, uh, she placed her son in the office working for the, working for him, her finances. And this is where I'm guessing the MI5 came onto this. Her finances were um, illicit or shady finances that were coming out of China and Hong Kong to her office, you know, to turn around and to give to um, her members of parliament. Whereas in the meantime, she had local uh, regular contact with the PRC embassy in London. So you can see the uh, the British China project, British Chinese project to the top, uh, top left is it was actually run by her other son, Michael Wilkes. So she she got pretty well. She uh, had her reach that went out to Scotland and to Scotland Parliament as well. So um, the, you know we, we have a, a similar problem in the Congress, and I've had members of Congress tell me that look. You know, someone comes in my door and they're from my district and I have no idea, you know, who they are, what background they are. You know, I have no idea what the uh, that the um, the connections are with my companies. So this is a problem that I know we wrestle with. And I'm assuming it's going to be the same pretty you know, in democracies all over the world. You know, you want to serve your constituencies, but you don't know who's walking in your door at any given point in time. OK, so we've looked a little at the covert influence cases. Let's look at some real hardcore cases. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, Xu Yanjun, he was a uh, MSS officer. He was an actual MSS case officer. Um, and uh, he was lured to come to Belgium. This is his um, his uh, his initial his uh, his forms from being in the MSS. And on the right, you see a translation uh, for his appointment form. So he was originally. Um, uh, worked out of Jiangsu province, and uh, he was with the Jiangsu State Security uh, Bureau. And he lured through uh, Nanjing University of, um, of uh, uh, Aviation and Aerospace. Uh, he lured a, a U.S. scientist, David Zhang, out of uh, you know uh, the U.S. and came to uh, came to China to speak. He was introduced under the cover of a um, of a uh, uh, a local, the Jiangsu uh, uh, Association for Science and Technology. And in other words, that's a daisy chain, what we call the university brings him over at the behest of the Ministry of State Security. So they're closely cooperating. They bring him over and then they um, turn around and pass him off to uh, to um, that, uh, you know, to the local department, to the, uh, you know, to the local Ministry of State Security undercover as the, um, as the uh, National, as the Science and Technology Association, Nanjing Science and Technology Association. So what we have in the center here is um, Xu and his contacts. And this trick, I'll call it, but this work where universities inviting them and then introducing them to the local Nanjing Science and Technology Association work. And you can take a look at the individuals that he went and um, and actually entertained and brought over to give speeches at Nanjing University. Now, um, really, while he was there, uh, if you take a look at, you know, not only did they try and bring people over repeatedly so they eventually could put them on a recruitment path, but while they were there, 
and he was entertaining them as that representative of the Science and Technology Association. Uh, these are the people that he had the eighth division uh, actually attacking their laptops. So, uh, you know, I, I read the text that he was sending back and forth to people and in the Ministry of State Security, those individuals you see on the left, um, uh, Xu Hong and uh, Chen Feng. Um, and as they are, um, as they're having a party toasting the person, toasting the invited guest who's giving a speech, he's up inside their hotel room with others trying to break into their laptops and with other technical experts trying to get into their laptops. And the emails going back and forth are extraordinary. Now, you know, we're going to need at least three hours to get into this at, uh, laptop. And they're literally, as they're, you know, as they're, their host is sitting there, you know, drinking and, and eating right next to him saying, no, 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 we can only keep this guy here for another hour. Um, it's, uh, you know, you, you've got to make it happen within that time. Yeah. And in several cases, they're inserting a virus. There's some interesting uh, work that was done against Saffron Aviation. On the upper left, Gu Zhen and Tian Xi were locals working inside of Saffron in China, and they were both recruited. Gu Zhen was a, um, uh, in charge of cybersecurity for Saffron in China. And he was recruited. And of course, they um, they uh, tried to put a, uh, a virus, actually, they didn't plant a virus into uh, Frederick Haskell's um, uh, laptop when he went. He went to actually present in China. And uh, as his uh, pictures, as his slides came up, they didn't seem to be working. And they said, well, what's, no, no, no you need a, a codec upgrade. And they gave him an upgrade, and that was about all. It was a virus that they had implanted into his computer. So we have a number of cases where there are invitations that come out, paid invitations that come out for um, for lectures and presentations or cooperation, you know, within China. That is used as a stepping stone for eventual recruitment of the individual. And lastly, it's also used to um, to do technical penetration. So they're pretty comprehensive in and how they approach their target set. I'll note lastly on this slide. Um, uh, Xu Yanzhong was using a cover name of Zhang Hai, and uh, he was using that on LinkedIn, which he did a lot of approaches on LinkedIn, specifically Linda Lee on the lower left. Uh, but uh, Ji Chao Chun was a U.S. Army reservist. He was actually recruited in China, and uh, he recently got convicted for, uh, and uh, Xu Yanzhong was his case officer handling him. He was actually uh, became a Mormon, which is interesting, and uh, was targeting people who were in the Mormon church, Chinese or in the Mormon church who were traveling to China, specifically aerospace engineers. So really interesting the way their intelligence service works and kind of branches out and uses local contacts to be able to um, uh, conduct trade craft. Okay, um, I think that's actually done a bit early, uh, but that's sort of uh, my baseline. I'll, I'll just give you, um, uh, I didn't want to go over, so, uh, but um, if you take a look at my website, uh, I have like um, this presentation will be on. I have a lot of presentations that are on, a lot of reports, a lot of articles. It's all in the library section or a publication section. And you can just you know go. And if it's useful for you, great. Um, you'll also see things like online courses and stuff that um, on this subject that you can uh, uh, look at as well. Anyway, that's all I have immediately. And uh, I'm guessing we have a fair amount of time for questions and answers. Thank you.